Okay, well, we'll go ahead and get started then uh, with section 2.8. 2.8 was on one to one functions. These are very, very nice class of functions. Um, they're even more nice, I would say, than, than things we've studied before. Um, one to one functions have this really nice property that if you pick different inputs for your function, if you pick different inputs, you are guaranteed a different output. Okay, so to write that down formally, if input one does not equal input two, so if you pick different things, then the output or the heights of the function at those two different inputs are also not the same. If you pick different inputs, you get different outputs. Okay. Um, so these are really, really nice, very applicable type of function. These are the things that you deal with all the time outside of, outside of academics here in the world. Um, but uh, it's not always an easy task to determine if something is or is not a one-to-one -one function. This first question, number 16, is the absolute value of x. It's just asking, is it one-to-one -one or is it not one-to-one? -one? So we can ask that one question at the top. If I pick different inputs, it will have repeated uh, uh, well, in, input. So maybe we can yeah, get, I think what you're getting at, maybe we can pick out some different inputs that are different. Maybe you have something floating in your mind where we pick different inputs, but we get the same input, the same output. If we can do that, then this is not one to one. AJ, do you have something? Right, right, yeah, these are not the same. So let's see what we get. For negative two, we plug it in and we get the absolute value of negative two, which is two. And wouldn't you know, when you plug in two, you also get two. So we picked different inputs, we got the same output. So this is not one to one. This is two to one. We picked two different out or inputs, we got one single output. Okay, it's a different class of function, if you will. It's in a different class. It's two to one instead of one to one. So this is a nice, a nice example of something that's not one to one. And this is exactly the way that you would prove that something is not one to one. You have to find, and this is the difficult part, you have to find different inputs that give the same output. Let's do another one that's just a little, a little bit different. The question is, is it one to one? Who thinks yes? One to one. You can't think of a counterexample, so yeah, it's probably one to one. No one. So everyone has a counterexample. All right, hit me with one.
It's not, it's not always the case. Here's the proof. So the X and negative X is what he's saying. So plug in the positive and the opposite of it. Well, this is going to be the same, right? So if you plug in positive X, nothing changes. If you plug in negative X, this doesn't change, but this becomes plus 2X. So it's not necessarily the same. But this does work for one number, X. You plug in the positive of it and the negative of it, you get the same thing. That number is zero. What does that give us? Zero. Okay, give me another input that also gives us zero. And we'll have our proof, right? Two. I plug in two, I get four minus four. These are not the same, but these are the same. So this is not one to one. Okay? This is not easy, right? I mean, how many are online plus all of these us six here sat here thinking about this for a few minutes and didn't come up with it or I don't know, didn't say it. You know, so one of these two things happened. It's not necessarily easy to figure out a counterexample of this. You just have to sit there scratching your head for a little bit, thinking about it, maybe trying some examples. Um, fortunately, there's a nice handy method if you have the graph, right? If you have the graph, so that's a big if. With the graphing utility, you can do this at any point, right? You just look at the graph and you do something called the horizontal line test. Just like the vertical line test, right? You do a vertical line test to see if a, fun if a graph is a function. If it touches the line of the graph at any, but at one point only ever, or no points, you've got yourself a function. Uh, I misspoke. A vertical line can be intersected. No points. Okay. If we'll get to this. So a horizontal line test is simply this. If you have a graph of a function and you can draw horizontal lines through it, okay, and those horizontal lines only ever touch once, it is a one-to-one -one function. This is not. Because right through this middle zone, I can draw a horizontal line. That touches one, two, three times. All three of these x's, whatever this x1 is, whatever this x2 is, and this x3, all three of those give the same height. Right? So the horizontal line test is just like a vertical line test, but you're going horizontal lines and you're checking to see if that graph is only ever touched at most one time. If so, you've got yourself a one-to-one -one function. Okay. okay. The next one I was going to move on to was question 45. Um, says use the inverse function property to show that f and g are inverses of each other. So 45, 1 over x minus 1. Okay, so I, I can't remember the inverse, but we're gonna, I'm going to do this as an exercise real quickly. What this says to do is you plug in an x, you subtract 1, right? That's the first thing you would have to do. And then you take one divided by that result. So the inverse is the exact opposite of these things. Okay? 
So we took one divided by the result last, so now this happens first. So I'm gonna guess g of x is one over x. And then plus one, because the first thing we did initially needs to be the last thing we do in this new function. Inverse literally means you've done a process. Now, do, those, do that process in reverse order to get back to where you were. That's what inverting a process is. Okay, so first we subtracted one, then we took one over the result. Here, we do one over the thing, and then we add one. I'm guessing that's the inverse. And that's what I think we're supposed to get. So we're good. So what is the inverse property? The inverse property says if f of g of x and g of f of x are x, so they both equal x, you just compose these two things together. This composed with that, you get x. This composed with this, you get x. Then F and G are in each other. In this sort of math lingo, it's, it's a little bit odd, but let's interpret this a little more. X is your input, right? A function represents a process you do to your input. So what this is saying is, if you do this process first to your input, and then do this process again to that output, you get your original input back. So this function does something, it's a process, it does something to x, and this undoes it. So you get x back out. This one says also in the other order, if we do the process f first and then G undoes it. They're inverses. So both ways. Okay. So our question is are these inverses of each other? And by design, they will be. But as a mathematical skill, this takes some practice. So let's just do f of g of x first. We're composing together. So into this function, we're plugging in that function. So x is replaced by one over x plus one. So one over x minus one. So it's one over x goes in x is plus. Now if this miraculously simplifies to just x, we've answered that this is x, right? And that's the first part of our task. Well, we can remove these parentheses without anything happening. No negative signs to distribute products to distribute nothing. So there we go. Clearly, plus one minus one cancels. So this is one over one over x. How do you divide fractions? You don't. You flip and multiply. So times x times x on top and bottom. And we've got our result. This is just x. Okay. That's the first one. F of g is x. Second one. This g of f. So we're going to take the function f and plug it in for x here. So g is 1 over x plus 1. We're going to plug the whole function f right there. So 1 over 1 over x minus 1. Okay, nobody. Divides fractions, we always flip and multiply. So this is times x minus 1 times x minus 1. You do it on top and bottom. 
This, of course, cancels. So we get x minus 1, which, of course, is. So these are inverses of each other. A good question to consider later on in life, perhaps, is are there functions that have one of these always being x, but the other one not? Sort of a left-hand inverse, but not being the right-hand inverse. It only inverts it one way, but not the other way. It's a good question to consider. Questions on this, though? Is that understandable? The idea was understood well, I hope. So the last question from this section, and I'm only going to do three, uh, has to deal with just determining uh, if a function is one to one on a specific interval. So it's not too bad. I think it's number 64. I remember correctly? Yes. And it's this, 1 over x squared. You know, try erase board markers don't break on you. They run out, clearly, but don't break. Okay, 1 over x squared. Uh, before I even get into this, is this 1 to 1 or invertible? One to one. Can you think of two different inputs that give the same output? You can't think of one thing. What happens with squares? Think about that. I think it's not one to one. Right, it's not. Can you give me two inputs? Um, two and negative two. Same thing. This gives us one fourth, this gives us one fourth. It's not one to one. Okay. But the question's asking us if this thing is one to one in a specific domain. Right? So globally, this is not one to one. But can we find a region of its domain where it is one to one? And they suggest. Is it one to one if we're only dealing with positive numbers? Yeah. Yes, it is, right? Yes. So the way you would prove this, right, is you would suppose x1 does not equal x2. And both x1 and x2 are positive. Right? You'd suppose they're different. And then you would work this out. 1 over x squared, x1, x1 squared, x2 squared. You would ask yourself, can these ever be equal? And the obvious answer is no. Because squares are unique. If you take a number that's different from a different one, and you square both of them, you always get a different result. Squares are unique if they're both positive numbers. So one over the squares is also unique. And you've done it, right? It, it's that argument that I just spoke out that you would write on in paper, and that would be full credit marks right there. This is how you would go about proving within this range, or this domain, I should say, carefully, that you've got unique outputs for unique inputs. So this is one to one in that domain. Not globally, but in the stomach. So that's all I have for 2.8. Uh, it's just about finding one to one functions, finding inverses, showing things are inverses of each other. Can I ask a question about uh, a specific question about a, a specific? <laughs> yes. uh, Question in the homework 2.8. Um, yeah. 
I used up all of my chances in the homework to like for the, to submit an answer. Um, and it's the if an equation with um, x, well, the equation is um, nine, a g x equals to um, x squared plus 10 x. And with x less or equal to negative five. Um, and then a comma find g, uh, g negative one and uh, within x of um, 24. Oh, of uh, 24? Yeah, so, sorry. Like that? Yeah, um, wh when I, I, sub I put in the 24 instead of gx when I was solving it, um, because for a previous, like a question earlier um, that was similarly phrased, and my I put in the answers of four, and I I don't know I I couldn't an answer um I couldn't find how to do it in the book, or at least I couldn't. Yep, I understand. Yep, I understand. So the question you know it's, it says find this. In other words, it's it's asking this question. Okay, for what x is g of x twenty four. Okay. This is what inverses do. If, if g is a function, right? So we have some x as our input. g takes this and brings it to 24 in our outputs. g inverse does the exact opposite process. The exact opposite. So where does g inverse take 24? Right back to x because it undoes whatever g did. So we have this game now that we can play. It's, it can be a guessing game or it can be a mathematical algebraic game. In your head, maybe you can figure out what do I have to plug in in order to get 24? I think I've already got it. Start picking your integers. Zero, nope, one, nope. Try another one. <laughs> okay. Two would seem to work, right? But it doesn't fit this. We have to get something less than or equal to negative five. So what else? Well, here we go. We're gonna do it. So uh, this is the big clue. For what x is g of x 24? That's what this means. We've received 24. Now we're going to go backwards with the young inverse. So this is the clue, huge clue right there, which is the same thing. So what this means is we've got x squared plus 10x is 24. Let's solve it, right? Bringing 24 over, do subtraction. So x squared plus 10x minus 24 is zero, and now it's the familiar solving zeros problem. Uh, we can factor this with 12 and two, right? right. So we get x minus two, x plus 12 is zero. So what's the other answer? I said two works, right? Got to be negative 12. Right here. These give our answers of x equals 2 and x equals negative 12. Let's go back. If I plug in 2, I get 4 plus 20, 24. But 2 is not less than or equal to negative 5. Plug in negative 12. 144 minus 120. 24. So this is. This is a great question because we've turned this question into solving zeros of parabolas, which we know how to do quite well. How did you know that in this situation that you needed to use the zero property? I, it sort of came about, right? Yeah. So, so I didn't know right away. I was clueless. 
when it said this, that was the first thing that I translated into just this. And that's just based on uh, the definition of inverse. The inverse, if, if I take an X and get 24, then the inverse of 24 should equal X. That's just the definition. That's what I threw down here. G of X is 24, so G inverse of 24 is X. That's the definition. So then I went to step two. The next logical step is this. That's just by definition of what G is, right? So here's G. G is equal to 24, so I wrote it down. And that's where solving for zeros came in. Because, because I kept putting, to, uh, I kept trying to carry the, um, uh, like um, my solution ended with x equals like um, root of fourteen. Oh wait, I, I think I missed an x next to a ten. That's why. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that would be it. That's what. Those negative signs or those numbers that you say like this, like two, and write something else. These are the things that always get checked, you know? <laughs> You're thinking it in your head, but you don't write it down. Yeah? Okay, other questions about 2 8. No? Okay, I'll give you another 30 seconds while I get, prepare the next question. Questions on 2.8. Okay, 3.1 is where we wrap right back around to talking about parabolas or quadratics or second degree polynomials. They're all the same. So we come right back to it here. And as Nick said when he came in, he was a little confused. Uh, because there's this difference in language that exists in the world nowadays. Um, when I grew up and learned about polynomials in general, standard form meant standard form of a polynomial was put the highest degree first on the left and keep going. This is maybe even how you learn it, right? But if you leaf through this book, Standard form is not like that. What I think of standard form is ax squared plus bx plus c. And what I think of as vertex form is ax minus h squared plus a. This is what I call vertex form because the vertex of this parabola is at hk. Now, if you're not dealing with parabolas, this is what I was saying to Nick. If you're dealing with any other polynomial, this is standard. And this doesn't even make sense. When you talk about a cubic, here's what it looks like, or maybe even like this. Where's the vertex? What's the vertex form? There's no such thing as a vertex there. There's, there's a max here, a vertex, I guess, another vertex here. When you're talking about something with x to the fourth, you could potentially have something like this. Excuse me. Where's the vertex there? Right? So, so for the longest, for everything else, there's a standard form, and this doesn't make much sense. Standard form is you put the highest power first, and you decrease the powers to the right. So in 33, they give you this and they ask you to put it into standard form. 
when I was preparing for today, I thought, well, it's pretty close. <laughs> Standard form is just rearrange these things. Negative x squared minus x plus 1. Done. But when I was answering the next steps of the problem, which are to find zeros, x-intercepts, to find max and min, to find vertex, it's, it's not super easy, unless you put this in vertex form first. So I'm pretty sure that's what they want me to do. They wanted me to do when I was looking at this problem, and when I look back at the section, indeed, they don't call this standard form. They call this, I, I don't even care to look at what they call it. So they want you to translate this into vertex form, what I call vertex form, what they call standard form. So there might be confusion for you, but let me say it once. If I want standard form, I want this. Okay? All right. Um, yeah, sure. Okay. So let's put this in vertex form to try and answer that question of where the vertex is. It's a nice, easy way of doing this. It's called completing the square. I thought that might be hazy for some of us, so I thought it'd be a good opportunity to do that. This isn't a perfect square, right? I can't write this as x minus something squared, right? Can you even factor that? That's a good, a better question. Let's take out the negative sign and ask, can you even factor? factors we got here. Negative one and one, right? It has to be. If we're going to use whole numbers, it has to be. So that means we got to have an x minus one and an x plus one. But that's not this, right? Because negative one and one don't add up to plus one, they add up to zero. So we can't even factor this. Oh, okay, that's where completing the square comes in handy. So what we want to do is turn this inner part into a perfect square, and the secret lies with this coefficient here, which is one. The simple process, once you've got this as a one, all you do is take half of this number, square it, and add it here, and subtract it here. Very simple process. I'll repeat it. Once you've factored out everything here, so that you've got just a positive one here. You take half of this, half of one is half. So you square it to get one fourth. And then you add it and subtract it. What is this? It's zero. So we've not changed the thing, right? We've added zero into this whole mix. But the awesome result is that x squared plus x plus one fourth is exactly x plus one half, the thing that we squared, half of this middle part squared. The awesome result is that what you've got here is a perfect square. What would be an example of add up square when you when you're using um, when 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 you divide the second um, number next to an x and then you times it? Uh, what would be like a situation where it it did not cancel each other out and it did not input here where it won't cancel itself out? Yeah. Never. It, it would always cancel each other out, right? So every... It is, you're, you're designing it to do so. Oh, okay. It, it's an intentional result. What, what you want is, right, you've got some ax squared plus bx plus c. You're taking the a out, so you get a x squared plus c over a, x plus c over a. So this is where we were, here. <laughs> 
You intentionally, oops, <laughs> you intentionally divide this by two, and you add and subtract it because you want this. You want to add nothing, right? That's your goal. You don't want to change what you're working with. You want to change its form. You don't want to change it. If you were to add a non-zero thing here, you're going to change it. I, thank you. So we, yeah, it always ends up being like that. Always, always. always. Anyway, uh, so pretty darn close now to standard form. We just got to redistribute the negative sign. So, well, standard form slash vertex form. So the book calls it what I call it is negative x plus one half squared plus five over four. Okay. So this is what I would have said was the answer. This is what the book really wants for the answer, I suspect. And to answer the following questions, uh, find its maximum and minimum and find its vertex. Well, fortunately, the vertex of a parabola is always its maximum or its minimum. Okay. Oh, unless you're working on a restricted domain. But globally, the vertex is either the max or the min. So the vertex is the point negative one half five fourths. So what is the maximum value? Well, we see this as a negative sign, right? So what's the graph of this thing look like? Here's negative one, negative two, one, two, one, two. The graph of this looks like this. We've got negative one half comma five fourths. And because this is a negative sign, it comes down. I don't know where it crosses the x-axis, so we're, we're going to get there. There you have it. That's the graph. And the maximum is 5 fourths. It's the height of that vertex. Because it comes down, that vertex is the maximum. What's the minimum here? There is not. Right? If I say it's this number, I just pick a bigger x and it goes down further. Right? If I say it's oh here, well, I just pick another bigger input and it goes down even more. There's no minimum. That's that's 33 and my soapbox on standard form. Uh, my um, Oh, that's my petition, my federal and state petition to formally get this reinstated as standard form is in the works. I'd appreciate your signatures. <laughs> okay, any questions on this? Nick, go ahead. Yeah, so you always factor out anything that's on the x squared. So first, factor that out. So here's a negative. So we're going to take it outside. So you got to make sure you change the signs of everything here. If it's a number, you're going to divide everything in here by that. Okay. Then what you do is you look at the linear term, the x to the first. You take its coefficient, divide it by 2, and square it. So we get 1 half squared is 1 fourth. We add and subtract that in. And that guarantees you that this part is that perfect square. It's x plus what you square. So we squared the one half. So it's always x plus what you square squared. 
and then it's either plus or minus whatever comes after. Everything else is just right there. Everything else in the perfect square. And if you need more instruction or work on that, it's just called completing the square. Complete the square. So if you want to Google it, if you Google this phrase, complete the square, practice, or PDF, or homework, whatever, you'll get hundreds of these problems to do on your own. And probably twice as many video YouTube movies. Still in 3 1. Wanted to do another problem. This one's 47. Find a function f whose graph is a parabola with the given vertex and that passes through the given point. Okay, so this is an interesting question. An interesting question because you know oftentimes you're asked to give the equation for a line. So you have to find the slope and you have to find the y-intercept. Well, why can't we do that with a parabola? Okay, two negative three. Okay, and the point that it goes through is three one. Okay, well, just like with lines, there's all these different forms that you can use, that you can use as your cookie cutter for what it should look like, right? We're gonna use the exact same idea. We're gonna choose a form that seems to fit the information we've got. We're gonna use the information we've got to fill in the missing information. Which form would you like to use? Standard or vertex form? Vertex form? Yeah, probably vertex form. Yes, great answer. Thank you. That should have been faster. <laughs> <laughs> yep. When you're given the slope and a point the line goes through, you use slope intercept form, right? Because you're given the slope. If you're given the vertex, you use vertex form right away. You can do it the other way, of course. You can. But it's a little more difficult. So let's use vertex form. Vertex form is you've got some number times x minus h squared plus some number k. The vertex is at h, k. So we're just going to put that information in. The vertex was given two. I didn't change the negative sign because this is not negative. If this were negative, this would be plus two. Plus k, k is negative three. So I've changed the plus to a minus because we've got a negative three. So the only thing we need now is a, this little coefficient that's out in front. Okay, but this is our cookie cutter. The equation for our parabola so far is y equals a times x minus 2 squared minus 3. Now this point is the key. What it gives us is one pair of coordinates. An x value that gives a certain y value. Okay. So what, what this point means is if we plug in 3 to this, we need to get 1 out. So from this point, 1 is a times 3 minus 2 squared minus 3. Just use the data given to us. 3, 1. And now we just need to solve. This is 1 squared, right? So it's 1. So we have 1 equals A minus 3. So A must be 4. A number minus 3 is 1, so 
got to be working for it. Yes, I make a mistake. What happens to the three minus two? Oh, what is that number? Three minus two. Uh, one. Uh, and square it? One. What's A times one? Oh. Answer your own question. Good job. Yay! All right, it's just one. All right, no, I didn't write it. Sorry, skipped over that. Keeping me honest, that's what I need. Yep. Okay, so A is four, right? And there we have it. So that's all we needed. The equation for this parabola is four times x minus two squared minus three. There it is. So uh, usually, I mean, you just consider these things as data, and you, you sort of look at, uh, you know, what form of the equation seems to match your data, and then you just use whatever data is available left over to find the missing pieces. Okay. Um, I, something subtle, I guess, is notice I didn't plug this back in. I chose this point to plug in instead of this point, right? If I plugged in negative three and two here, what would I get? I would get negative three equals zero minus three. Negative three equals negative three, right? So if you chose vertex form, don't plug the vertex point in, plug the other point in. If you choose the wrong form, what will happen is you'll have to use both points and you're gonna get a system of equations that you'll have to solve. I'm not gonna go through it because it's ugly. It takes a while, but you can do it. Okay, questions on 47 or other things from 3.1. That's all I have down for going through. It's, it's about problems again, you know, things like this, so. Questions? I have a question for question six um, to find the value of the function. Right. And then that says let t equal x, squ um, x squared. And I wasn't sure what that meant. Um, okay, give me, can you give me your exact problem after I clear some space on the floor? The book differs a little bit from what's online. They switch numbers around. So my number six gives a graph and it gives an equation, but you need to give me the equation. So um, numbers. F of x. Um, f of x equals to nine plus four x squared minus four to the power of four. X to the fourth. Uh, no, sorry, just just an x to the power of four. Okay, this doesn't look like a parabola, right? Because it's not, but it has a similar form. And so what she asked was, what does this mean, this phrase? Let t equal x squared. What that does for, for vortex like this, that are in this form, no line, no third power, just a square and a core power. You can do the substitution where you let x squared equal just t, and it turns your problem into something like this. F of t is nine plus four t minus t squared. That's a parabola. What? Got tools in our toolbox for that. Nice, cool. For this. Does that answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Other questions on 3 1. Nick, you said you wanted to talk about it maybe a little bit more. So, was there something you had in particular? Okay.
on what on what was the word you said there? What is it like solving the square? Completing the square. Yep. Oh, we can do one of those. Uh, let me just pick a random one here. Um, something that won't be gross, but is not trivial either. Okay, yeah, 43. 43 is not too bad. Okay, so I'm gonna use my number 43 as an example of completing the square. It's negative one half x squared plus x minus, uh, sorry, minus x plus three. So if I asked you to factor this, you'd have some trouble maybe. maybe not. But I think the first thing you would probably do is try and get rid of this fraction. That's what I would do. So let's factor that out. That was the first step I said. Factor out negative one half. That was our first step. Factor out anything that's on the x squared. So here we go. Negative one half. We took out a negative sign, so the signs all change. So plus here and negative here. We took out one half, so everything gets doubled because when you divide each of these terms by one half, you're actually multiplying by the reciprocal. So multiplying by two. This is x squared. This is two x. And this is six. That was the first step. Let's factor out whatever's in front of the A. Second step. Uh, uh, the coefficient. Okay, that's the number on x. Not the number on x squared. So I don't mean x everywhere, I mean just the x. So what number is on the x? It's two. So we'll have it, we get one. 2 over 2 is 1. Step 3. Add and subtract. The result from 2. Okay. So we got 1. So inside all this, inside everything. So right in place, we're going to add and subtract 1. So we've got negative one half x squared plus two x plus one minus one. So we're adding and subtracting the result from number two. And now, I mean, the last step four is rewrite. You've got it right there. Right in perfect. Where one. negative one half x squared plus two x plus one, that's just x plus one squared. Right, it's a quick factorization right there. This. Everything else gets just smashed together. Seven. The last step might be to simplify it a little bit, but this is it, right? So we, we can redistribute the negative one half. So we would get negative one half times that. And negative one half times this. And that's the final, final result. Okay, how are we doing on time? 8.59, already.
So now you all have studied the quadratic formula. I think that was in 3.1. Um, that's what this is, by the way. Every time you can square, you're redoing the quadratic formula in part, if not in whole. Um, it's a, if you want to, for any parabola, write down a formula for the solutions for the zeros of it, you have to complete the square and that's it. That's, that's all you do. The solutions for the zeros of any parabola are the completed square results. So it's another thing, two things to think about today. Okay, um, 3.2 was on polynomials and rational functions. Uh, everything gets a whole lot more difficult, several degrees harder uh, when you go from 3.1 to 3.2. Because instead of just working with you know lines or parabolas, now it's like you know typical math people, one, two, lots. Now you work with everything else, right? Here's the training wheels, and now okay, you're ready for everything else. So you're you're being asked in 3.2 to be able to graph anything of any power. You're being, able to ask, you're being asked to transform anything of this nature. Uh, and what's worse is you're asked to do the same thing for rational functions. So x plus x squared minus x cubed all over x squared plus 1. You're asked to do the same things for things like this. So the difference in difficulty from there to here, it's, it's significant. So I, have quite a few problems ready to go. So five, it says to sketch the graphs of the functions by transforming the graphs. Um, we're gonna do these ones really fast because this is review. Uh, and these are, all, uh, these are all x squared graphs. So A, uh, uh, we're working with x squared. This is our original function. A says, okay, What's the graph of x squared plus 4 look like in comparison to this one? Go ahead. Up 4. Yep, we just shift this graph up 4. All right, the next one was, I think, negative x squared uh, plus 4. What happened to that graph? Plus four does what? Shift up four. Same thing. That's this shift up four. Same thing. What does the negative do here? X, X. X, X. Yeah. Uh, another way to say it is turn upside down. Okay, so this graph, I'll draw little sketches, looks like this. This graph looks like that. This graph looks like this. Okay, C, uh, it is negative x minus four. Handle it in pieces. What's this negative sign do? Inverts the signs of everything. It flips it upside down. It reflects it across the x-axis. Okay, so, so turn upside down. What is the minus four inside the squared? Shift 
shifts right four. Graph like this, one, two, three, four, and upside down. Yes? Shouldn't you distribute the negative? Or why don't you do that? Why don't you do that? Yeah, distribute the negative. Great question. So what does it turn into? Like that, right? Yeah. Why not do this? Well, I mean, these are the same. You're right. But this is plainly in the transformed format. This is not. This is factor. This is which is great. Helps you find the zeros, right? But this is quite clearly negative f of x minus 4. So we've flipped the function f upside down, flipped it, and we shifted it right back forward. Whatever it looks like is almost secondary. It's almost, we don't care about it. But we've transformed the function. That's the important part of this question, is what does the graph look like? Okay, so that was a refresher. We did that last chapter. Those same basic rules apply to any polynomial, anything. So if I gave you x to the fourth plus x squared, this is our original function name, f of x. That the exact same things. Okay, what's x to the fourth plus x squared plus four? What's that graph look like? It's the same, it's been moved up four. Okay, how about this one? Uh, negative x to the fourth plus negative Minus, minus x squared plus 4. Flipped and still shifted up 4. This is negative f plus 4. Flip the function, move it up 4. Negative x minus 4 to the 4 minus x minus 4 second plus four. It gets complicated, right? But if you see this, you know it's this graph, shifted right to the four, flipped, and then shifted up four. Yeah, yeah, it's negative f of x minus four plus four, right? That's all it is. That's what I'm saying, the difficulty goes up a lot. Right? Because you get something that looks extremely complicated, but you're just rinsing and reusing the same old things you did with these. Okay, so next problem, 11. Um, a polynomial is given, describe the end behavior. This is another big topic. End behavior. Okay, number 11, we're looking at the end behavior of x negative x of the plus x minus 4x. Part A was describe end behavior. So end behavior is asking, uh, end behavior rather describes what happens when x is very large okay. 
thing, what happens when X is large? There's two ways to be big, right? You can be big that way, or you can be big this way. You can be in the positive big numbers or negative big numbers. So we're just gonna look at this and see what happens when X becomes very, very large positively. Uh, let's see. When X is really big, what matters most here? Which of these terms matters the most when X is huge? Power of five. Yeah. Just to illustrate, okay? When X is 10, what's X cubed? Oh. Wow, that's a lot bigger, isn't it? This is almost inconsequential. Compared to that, this is 1%. Okay? When X is 10, what's X to the fifth? 100,000. Wow, X cubed is only 1% of that. So this is inconsequential, and this is even more inconsequential. So what does N behavior care about? This, the biggest power term. That's it. So let's look and see what happens when X to the fifth, or rather negative X to the fifth, see what happens to that when X gets very large. So I'm gonna write it this way. When X goes to, this arrow means goes to positive infinity. So it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger positively. Um, F of X goes to, well, this is what F of X really depends on. When x gets big, x to the fifth is bigger, right? And negative means bigger still, but in the negative direction. Negative infinity. In other words, if I can make x as big as I want in the positive direction, the result is the function f becomes as negative as I want. Negative infinity. Similarly, when x goes to negative infinity, what happens to the function? I plug in a negative number, what happens to negative x to the fifth? Careful. You're, you're right, but which direction? Positive or negative? Wait, yes, yes, you're right. Yes. When x becomes more and more negative, the negative sign then cancel. Yes, yes, wow, sorry. You're absolutely right. Man, I wish I could edit that out on YouTube. Maybe I could add like one of those beeps, like a curse word beep, right when I said no, you know? Uh, that'd be interesting. We'll see. Or an airplane or something like that. Yes, perfect. Yeah, so when x gets really, really negative, the negatives to the fifth power remain negatives. There's an odd number. They cancel with that. So this thing gets bigger and bigger and bigger in the positive direction. Okay, that's number 11. Um, Um, number 12 was something very similar, but it has an even power. Okay, and it has an even power with x to the sixth here. So it's positive x to the sixth. And it's the same question. So if our function was x to the sixth minus 26 x to the sixth, I don't know what that's going to here. As x goes to infinity, as x goes to negative infinity, what's the result? Well, this is gonna be much bigger than this eventually. So we don't care about this term, we care about this one. As x gets bigger, this gets bigger too. 
when this is positive, so is that. <clears throat> so our function goes to positive infinity as well. And because of this even power, when we plug in any negative number, it becomes positive. So the same thing happens here. The function still goes to positive infinity, even with increasingly more and more negative numbers. So the end behavior is what we're talking about here. End behavior, when x is huge. All right. So number 11 and number 12. And we'll get at number 16 here. Sketch the graph of the polynomial function. Make sure your graph shows all intercepts and exhibits the positive, the proper end behavior. I'm going to go with rough estimates here. This is number 16. It is 2 minus x and x plus 1. Got it, real quickly. Okay. Well, when you're given a factor polynomial, it's pretty easy to, to graph because the factors are the zeros, essentially. 2 is a zero, so it hits the x axis at 2. Negative 1 is a zero. So it hits the x-axis there. The only question we have left is, this is going to be an x squared type thing. The only question we have is, is it plus x squared or minus x squared? Is it a happy thing or a sad thing? Well, we just multiply it out. Negative x here times the positive x here is negative x squared. So what's this graph look like? Yeah. It has the proper end behavior. It has the proper zeros. What happens in the middle? I don't care about right now. That's for a computer to work out, right? But as I said, we're going to be doing this with more, more, and more, and more difficult problems. So here is number nineteen. The function we are given is minus. 2x minus 1, x plus 1, x plus 3. Okay, so what is this similar to? Just overall. Uh, the negative sign here, positive, positive, positive. So this is similar to a negative. x times x times x, similar to a negative x cubed graph which either looks like this, oh, sorry, negative x cubed looks like this, or it has a wiggle in the middle. Which one is it? Wiggle or no wiggle? How many zeros does it have? Three, so it has a wiggle. One half is a zero. From this, negative one is a zero. From that, negative three, one, two, three, is a zero. From that, and it looks like that one over on the far right because it's a negative x cubed. So it comes down like this, pops back up, and it looks like that. Generally speaking, it will have the proper end behavior has the proper zeros, the rest is for a computer to work out. The next question is 25. I've got one minute left. We can do it. So the question gives us x plus First, x plus 1 squared and 2x minus 3. We're asked to graph it. My first question is what is this similar to? What polynomial is it similar to? Well, we've got an x here, we've got an x squared here, and then 2x here. No negative signs, right? 
is positive x, positive x squared, positive two x. This is similar to a positive x to the fourth, which can look a couple different ways. It can look like this, it can look like this, Okay. It looks like a parabola or kind of wiggle. How do we determine where those wiggles are and where, what they touch and everything? Well, it's, it's these things, the zeros. We've got a zero at negative two. We've got a zero at negative one. We've got a zero, oh, and that's two zeros, actually, okay, two zeros. Um, and we've got uh, one zero at Three halves. Okay. It looks like this and it touches three ways. If you think about for a little bit how we can possibly have that shape with it only touching in three places, we need to have sort of a bounce happen. So if I just drew just like a straight line here, it touches one, two, three, four times. The only way for us to have three is if we sort of draw that horizontal line here and we have a bounce in the middle. So our graph is going to look like that. A quick way to remember this is if it's an odd power, it goes through. If it's an even power, it bounces. If it's odd, it goes through. Even it goes, it bounces. Odd, even, odd. Through, bounce, through. That's basically it for that section. Um, there was one more question I had, number 53, which asked you for x intercepts, maximum, minimum, things like this, but we're experts at that already. So thank you for coming. It's good to see you, six. And uh, thank you for coming online, people. It's good to see you as well. And thank you for participating today. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. I'll see you later, everyone. Thank you. Too.